think it's very important to think about stop, stop and frisk on a continuum, on a historical continuum and on a temporal continuum, on, on, a, on, a, on a practice continuum. So it's both part of a long history of aggressive, inflammatory, and violent policing in black and brown communities, um, but it's also an extreme mode that reflects a similar logic even when it's less violent and aggressive. So the logic of stop and frisk, the logic of the behaviors and the practices are not extremely rogue. They are just an extreme expression of an already existing logic that has been going on over a long period of time. And this is important to say because one of the, the, the ways in which we minimize and marginalize the power of these forces is we say, well, now stop and frisk is over. Isn't de Blasio going to win? And doesn't that mean that it'll, they'll end the policy and boom, boom, it's over, as if stop and frisk is itself the entire source of the problem? And of course, if we make uh, the kind of analysis that I'm beginning with, that won't be the case. We won't be able to simply say stop and frisk is a very specific and isolated policy. It's part of, in fact, an extraordinarily complex and uh, deep mode of criminalization. The process by which whole communities of largely poor, almost entirely black and brown, not only Latino brown, but black and brown skinned people, uh, who are criminalized as a class of people. The only way you can get this level of sort of stopping and frisking where there's constantly a so-called a crime just in progress with someone who just kind of looks like you is if you're really p policing uh, in the class logic of criminalization. The importance of this criminalization is that it reframes, it reframes what is a, a community that already faces racialized poverty, and I say that because the reason for the poverty is not just being poor, but being black or brown, which drives being poor. Racialized poverty, legacies of discrimination, and chronic discriminatory-based joblessness. So it criminalizes that community and reframes that discrimination as racialized character flaws. That's to say that the reason that these communities are in these situations is not due to structural racism or various modes of discrimination or historical forces or bad education or anything else, but in fact, the result of racialized character flaws. And this justifies a discriminatory status quo and encourages the expansion of the institutionalization of criminalization, like prisons, building of prisons, like expanding the stop and frisk program. Now, it, it shouldn't be surprising this generates an extreme lack of trust in the community or in black and brown communities. It's, it's a miracle that there's as much sort of trust and goodwill as there is. Um, but it, it also hinders, many scholars and community activists argue, it actually uh, hinders community policing efforts. Um, so, of course, for those of you who follow black popular culture and, and just in general black communities, this logic of, you know, the no snitch phenomenon isn't just about being invested in criminal activity. It's about drawing a hard line between people who trust and operate within the community and people who can't be trusted. As irrational as those decisions may be technically, as in I'm not going to tell anybody about this crime to my family, it actually, in the context of stop and frisk, in the context of this criminalization, renders the police a, a really problematic force, an untrustworthy force as a category. So let me give you a few numbers. I'm not sure we didn't discuss what we're going to break down. So if these are number, all numbers you have, give me the, I have these numbers, face. I'll keep an eye out. Um, one is that um, while New York has always been trouble on these questions, I can't remember a time when it wasn't. Um, and I'm a New Yorker and love New York, but what are you going to do? Um, these, um, the dramatic rise in stop and frisk practices was, uh, was an intentional set of policies um, designed at the turn of the 21st century, largely. And the New York Civil Liberties Union, a, a strong critic of the program, used the statistics released by the police department to gather data and uh, collate that data to show what kinds of practices were underway. So they used the, the police department's own statistics. So let me give you some basic ones. One is that in 2011, there were, I'm going to round these numbers so you don't get number crazy, so don't go checking and saying, well, she just was off by 1,697 people, you know, okay. There were 685,000 stops and frisks 
up from, so that's 685,000 people in 2011, up from 160,000 in 2003. So 2003, 160,000, 2011, 685,000. In 2001, 53 of, the, of those stopped and frisked were African American or people of African descent, and Latinos made up 32%. Whites accounted for nine, of, nine percentage points of this stop. 2011, 89% of those stopped and frisked happened to citizens who were not found guilty of any crime. So that means 89% of the people who were stopped and frisked were stopped and frisked for no reason whatsoever. The Civil Liberties Union took some numbers, sort of massaged the relationship between these numbers, and figured this out by age, young being somewhere in the ballpark of 16 to 24, that young men are remarkably stopped. And this is really significant around stop and frisk. Of course, all people are stopped, but young people are stopped the most. This is a youth issue in significant measure. Am I treading? We okay? All right. Um, young black men were 168,000 of them were stopped in 2011. That made up 25% of NYPD stops of just young black men in that one year. But they make up only 1.9% of the New York City population. So when you start controlling for age, you see a dramatic increase in the gap between how many are being stopped and how that relates to the city's population. So 168,000 stopped, 25% of the New York Police Department stops, but only 1.9% of the New York City population. For young Latino men, 104,000 stopped, 16% of the NYPD stops overall, but only 2.8% of the city's population. Young white men, 24,000 stopped, 3.8% of the New York Police Department stops, and 2% of the city's population. So you see a much closer alignment between percentage and stops uh, for whites than you see for black or Latinos. Now, one of the hidden factors that generates this ease by which these, these dis, dis, you know, just extraordinarily significant differences in racial profiling um, are taking place, one of the ways to mask this process is through the process of residential segregation. It's much easier to harass and, and stop and frisk and you know, interrogate members of a community if that community is, in a sense, invisible to those who are not being stopped and frisked. So Brownsville, and why I elected this clip, is because it is an extremely both poor and almost 100% African American and Latino community, and therefore is sort of easy to subject to mostly invisible, not invisible to the community members, but invisible to the public uh, in terms of the, the types of stops. So racial, neighborhood racial segregation, which is the result of a variety of other modes of structural racism, actually supports policies like stop and frisk significantly. It's much harder to stop and frisk in a fully integrated community because people know each other and, and those with more resources and more power can point out what's going on and has a, have an investment in doing so. But at the same time, stop and frisk, so it doesn't only actually uh, take place because of segregation, but it also helps propel it. So the, um, the same st statistical uh, source points out that in the sixth precinct in New York, which includes Soho and the village, black and Latinos make up only 8% of the population, but they accounted for 77% of those stopped. So there's a way in which it not only says, hey, you live here and we can police you and stop you anytime we want. We also, well, you don't live here, so we can police you and stop you anytime we want. You're breathing, we can police you and stop you anytime you want. You're speaking, we can police, you know, it's like the, the list goes on. The judge who ruled that stop and frisk was unconstitutional argued that um, it was quite clear from the numbers that the routine nature of the residents that were stopped in black and brown communities um, reveals that those same residents would not have been stopped if they were white. And while I'm not going to get into the legal components, there is a really interesting question about, which I'm going to come to in a moment, about being suspicious, looking suspicious, and what that means for uh, producing a, a motivation and justification. So the, the stop and frisk and the logic that sustains it, which is also our consent as a society, right? We can't just dump this all on the police. We can't dump it on the chief. We can't dump it on the mayor. This is really a process that is maintained by and sustained by uh, everyone, 
really, through silence, through complicitness, through um, lack of uh, activism in a variety of ways. But it's, it's propelled and normalized among otherwise decent people through three, three things. One is the use of myths, two is the development of fear tactics, and three is the activation of deep-seated racial bias. So the idea that stop and frisk reduces crime is actually a myth, and there's a lot of evidence. I'm going to skip through what I had here because I want to leave the floor and sit down. But you know, the idea that stop and frisk reduces crime and keeps people safe is actually a fiction, and that there's been no evidence that it has uh, reduced crime. In fact, the crime reduction numbers of 29% that fell between 2001 and 2010, which has been used to justify stop and frisk, are actually lower drops in crime than any number of other cities all of which do not have stop and frisk policies. So for example, 56% uh, violent crime drop in New Orleans, but they don't have a stop and frisk. 49% in Dallas, no stop and frisk. 37% in Baltimore, no stop and frisk. So the 29% drop in crime for stop and frisk is actually the least successful of those places with stop and frisk in, in operation. Fear tactics, Bloomberg, right after the ruling, basically attempted to frighten people into what would be the consequences of stopping stop and frisk by saying, um, well, you know, uh, I'm not going to change the tactics overnight because I don't want to be responsible for a lot of people dying, even though, of course, stop and frisk has shown to not yield much in the way of the result in stopping people who are killing people from killing each other. It terrorizes people into thinking, well, you know what, it's in place, let's leave it in place. We don't want any kinds of, uh, of, of crime to escalate out of control. So they use the myth that stop and frisk is preventing murder, even though 90% of those stopped are innocent, and using fear to support the myth and the policy. People will die, is the claim, without stop and frisk. Now, all of this is generated and propelled not just by individuals in policy positions, but by the role of deep-seated racial bias and negative stereotyping and the normalization of discrimination. You have to have a cultural logic of black people and, by extension, other people of brown skin as being criminal, predatory, and dangerous and in need of aggressive policing. It has to exist as a way of thinking in order to make this policy make any sense at all. During our discussion last night in the community forum, I was trying to make this point in a way that was uh, clarifying um, in a thoughtful exchange. And um, I was trying to explain that, you know, look, we can say that mostly upper middle class white men steal money from banks or in, use blank banks to steal money from people, use policies in the banking industry, but in no way do we make a claim that bankers as a class of people are in need of gross uh, policing and intervention. We make the case that there are some individuals who are bankers who do X, Y, and Z, but you have to have a logic which is operating here in and among African Americans. Now, there's a long history. I could spend a lot of time on it. I won't, but I will say that Katrina, Rodney King, Oscar Grant, Amadou Diallo, Central Park Five, that's a short list, and the customers at Barney's and, and uh, Macy's most recently where we discovered there's a police substation in your favorite store um, who have just literally targeted um, uh, patrons because they were not supposed to be able to afford any of the items in it, which is to say, not only do we keep you poor, but then we make sure if you save up your money that you can't spend it on these items, which we shouldn't be messing with anyway because that's part of the problem, but that's not the point. The point is that then when you spend it, we assume you stole it, so the cycle continues all the way around. Um, I will say, thank you for that, I know what that means, okay. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I will say in closing, though, that you know there are actually some rather really progressive and interesting police chiefs and others involved in obviously tremendously active communities in the legal profession, among young people, everywhere, activists. But I wanted to just mention this one gentleman, Chris Burbank, who's at Salt Lake City Police Chief, who's been doing an incredible job not only admitting and acknowledging and transforming the policing practices there, but really talking about it in a way that opens up some possibilities. And I think it's important to look for models that create new ways of policing, because the idea that we're actually going to have a, a police-free society is highly unlikely. So in the meantime, I think it's extremely important to look for alternative models that challenge the fear-based, myth-based, and ultimately racial stereotype-based policing that Stop and Frisk represents. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you all for, for being here. I'd like to first begin by congratulating everyone on Tuesday who shut down Ray Kelly. And I think that, I think that it needs, I think that we all recognize that the shutting down part was important because if it would have just been a protest, it wouldn't have garnered as much news, as much publicity, as much momentum. We wouldn't have received a letter from the president. We wouldn't have gotten the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and all of this stuff. So again, big congratulations. I know it's a lot of work and it's really hard. And a lot of the times we're not, we're not thankful enough to those who organize it. And it's um, something that we need to counter. Um, especially when we hear the vilification of those who organized it. What I want to talk about today um, is the divisions that exist in, uh, between a couple of divisions, but an important one between the university and that outside of the university. Um, most importantly, the, the community that is right next door that is so invisible so many times, um, where racial profiling has existed and has not ceased for, to exist, um, and where a lot of work has been done to try to counter it. Um, but what I want to talk about um, in, in continuing my congratulation of the students and of the community, but in particular the students in this part, because uh, I come from a global studies, international studies kind of background, and the way that we're trained is that we're going to go to other parts of the world and fix what's wrong over there, and that often distracts from things that are wrong over here. So in thinking about, in thinking about un undoing these divisions, I think that an important one is, is maybe to take up the framework that there exists not just a third world out there, but a third world in here. And this is supposed to be the first world. No, and it's only a couple of miles away. So um, something that I, I want to talk about is how these divisions, how these invisibilities are produced. And I think that one important way is by the way that we're taught to define certain things. So like the term criminal, um, when we think of criminal, we don't think of Wall Street bankers, right? We think of black and brown people, we think of poor people. Uh, when we think of, of drug users, this is actually um, something I think about quite a bit because I grew up in a poor black and brown and poor white community and, and it wasn't until college that I found out that middle-class white people do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> no, I and that they do it so casually and openly talk about it, and they're not afraid that they're going to get caught, because they're not most likely going to get caught, right? Um, so I, I, I'd like to always think about how it was that I even came to that thought. Well, one is because I didn't know middle-class white people, and two, though, is because the television was always telling me that, the news was always telling me that, films were always telling me that, and I believed them. Um, so how did, that, how did that take place? And so another thing, too, is how then that is produced in, in the world that we live in, in the spaces that we inhabit. So how is it that Brown University, for example, is considered a safe space and outside of Brown University is the unsafe space, or outside of College Hill is the unsafe space. It's gotten, it, and it's not even just Brown University, it's so many universities all over, the, all over the country where this is so, where they require the labor of poor people and need to have them close by, but they don't want anything to do with them, and so then they build like a, a world right next to them that is so, it, it's so enclosed and it's such a bubble that they don't have to interact. They don't have to see each other. Um, so how does this happen? And how does it happen then that like when we think about rape, we don't think of rape on campus, we think about rape in those unsafe spaces, right? It's, it's really created this, this idea, this fear among students, among not just students, but faculty, people involved in this bubble of the university to even go outside outside of the university because they're afraid of who they're going to see. And I got that when I first moved here. I, was, uh, I came to Providence last year and I was looking for my hot sauce because I need it for my eggs. And I was in... <laughs> 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 and I went to CVS, you know, because at home I can find it at, at the drugstores and they <laughs> didn't have it. And, um, and I asked the, the cashier, where can I get my hot sauce? And she's, she's looking at me like, oh, you're going to have to go to Broad Street for that. 
And I was like, what, what point me to it? She's like, are you sure? I'm like, well, yes, of course. And so I went, and it was, and it, and it was obviously it's only a, a mile away. It looks so different from here. But for me, it was really nice personally because it also reminded me of home. Um, and maybe this is why, one, one reason why I'm not afraid to go there, but I don't think that you have to be from a poor community to not be afraid. There's ways that you can, you can, you can remove that, that relationship of fright. And this is something that we really should talk about in order to undo these divisions. Um, something that then um, I think is important as a university community and as a community outside the university is how is it that we're gonna connect? And not so much so in solidarity, but actually connecting together because as we heard from last night, and this is not uncommon, um, a black student, a black student is gonna get racially profiled and it doesn't even matter, it doesn't matter what you do. If you look a certain way, you're still gonna get racially profiled. There's a lot of, there's a lot of fear on campuses. There's a lot of trauma that takes place. Um, even just walking, just getting on the bus to come to campus, if, even if you are a student. So how is it that the logic of what's out there has come into what's in here? Um, one thing that I always like to think about then is how can those of us who are in the university connect with the community that's been doing so many actions for such a long time um, and need people and need resources. We have so many resources here, students in particular, that like you were tasked and faculty were tasked with reading, with writing. Like how can we hack the things that we have to do to get credit for, right? To make them useful for people outside who are actually doing work with very, very little resources. And not only that, but how can we recognize that we can do a lot of learning, and in fact, I personally have gotten most of my learning done outside of the university. You do, you do so much learning, just uh, actually having a problem in your face that you need to take care of. So it's not even theory anymore. It's an actual problem. And you can harness all of the stuff that you've studied, right? in order to tackle it, but it's always going to be contextual, it's always going to be different. So the, the, the learning process is itself to, it, it, it's, in, it's a symbiotic relationship. It takes recognition though, if we're going to be learning outside the university, and, and I will tell you that, um, like, that, like I mentioned, I got my most important uh, political upbringing out on the streets, um, and I'm sure, I'll, Everyone that was involved in the organization of Monday and Tuesday learned so much, so much probably than they probably learned in their entire time at Brown, in just those two days, or in, in the, in the run-up to those two days. Um, but what it does take is a recognition that those without PhDs, those without masters, those without bachelors, those without GEDs are equally intelligent. They have just, people have different kinds of intelligences, different kinds of skills, and then how are then are we gonna organize all of that in order to create something? So um, I'll leave it at that. Um, what I do wanna do, just I'll leave off on a note that there are some community members here that they have a lot that we can learn from and they can uh, start talking about with us, uh, uh, brainstorming about ways of how it is that we can start working together and I and and I encourage them and welcome them to be the first on the mic if we can give them that space when we get over to Q&A and if they're comfortable with that. Thank you. In my capacity teaching crime in the city here at Brown in the Urban Studies program, um, I went to the talk uh, with Ray Kelly and I actually wanted to hear what he said but coming from uh, statistically the worst in terms of crime rates, neighborhoods in LA, and growing up in the 1990s in those neighborhoods, and being stopped literally every single day by members of the crash unit, that's the Community Resources Against Street Hoodlums uh, unit, who would pull up in unmarked cars, jump out of the car, and without saying a word, they would grab me and my friends, and they would interlock our knuckles, and they'd crush our knuckles to the point that my knuckles would be black and blue for days at a time. But when they did it three di consecutive days in a row, they would just stay black and blue and get progressively worse. And they'd put their knee in my back, 
And if you would say, and the worst thing I ever carried in my pocket, I would tell the truth now, it's been a long time, the worst thing I ever carried in my pocket was a marker. And they'd put me against the wall, and they'd put their knee in my back, and if I dared, you know, I was scared, if I dared say, um, what is this all about? They would, with their hot breath, get in my face and say, shut your effing mouth, or you're going to go to jail. Shut your effing mouth. So I was never able to say something. Imagine the, the frustration that causes. So... In, my, in that capacity, going to the talk um, two days ago, when I saw students tell the commissioner of New York Police Department to shut his effing mouth, I was incredibly proud. <laughs> so, so with all due respect to President Paxson, who said that it was a sad day for Brown, in that capacity of mine, it was the happiest day at Brown I've seen since I've been here. So, so I just want to say a few things about how to even uh, discuss issue of stop and frisk, and this is just some of the things to think about uh, the terminology that's used. First of all, stop and frisk is not a policy, a policy which is a protocol or codified system of rules for governing behavior. It's not a policy, it's a practice. If it was a policy, it could be ended, it could be stopped, it could be overturned. But the fact is, what they call in New York actually is stop, question, and frisk mm -hmm. is a practice. And this is a crucial distinction since a policy could be overturned, but a practice, they say, is in the hearts and minds of people. A practice is in the hearts and minds of officers whose perspective it, they find difficult to unlearn, outlaw, or even identify. So the fact that it's a practice makes it very, very tricky to even get at the heart at. To ask a police officer to not stop, question, and frisk means to ask them to get another job. So that's very difficult to do. So stop and frisk is a practice of stopping people, and it's based on reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. Reasonable sus suspicion is identified, even in case law, by the way, as having a hunch. Having a hunch that criminal activity is being committed. Um, this, is, this is even a lower standard in legal settings than probable cause. To have probable cause is to have apparent facts discovered through logical inquiry that would lead a reasonably intelligent and prudent person to believe that an accused person has committed a crime. But reasonable suspicion is even less than that. So such stops, which are also known, by the way, as Terry stops, even before stop and frisk, are based on an officer's reasonable suspicion of involvement in criminal activity. And these Terry stops were actually upheld by the Supreme Court in what's called a Terry versus Ohio in 1968. It's actually legal to stop people based on that very subjective feeling, that hunch that something has gone on. So the court ruled that reasonable suspicion would justify a stop but police must be able to point to specific and articulable facts that would indicate that a reasonable person, to a reasonable person, that a crime has been committed or is about to be committed. So the issue of specific and articulable facts is very difficult, not only for me to say, evidently, but for me to think about. So in Floyd versus New York City, just recently, Judge Shenlin, the, the Federal District Court of Manhattan, wrote that, and this is also very crucial in thinking about stop and frisk, that the bringing up stop and frisk in the courts is not about the effectiveness of stop and frisk. You could have an all-day discussion about whether or not it's effective. We'll never really know because once crime rates are in, once Comstat has spoken, once crime rates have gone up and down, you could point to a million different things. I think the crime rate in New York has gone down because more people wear purple shoes. It's very difficult to say what the reason is. The issue brought before Judge Shenlin that she ruled on is the constitutionality of stop and frisk. Our, our highest measure. And as she points out, overwhelmingly, most stops that become frisks, that is stop, question, and then become frisks, are based on something equally subjective and fuzzy and odd, and that is furtive movements. That is these stealthy movements, these acts and these ways of looking that make a police officer think that a person is acting suspiciously. Again, this is how people police officers police people's lives, these very subjective, I have a hunch that something is going on ways. But identifying a fear of movement must again be specific and articulable. It's very difficult to articulate what a, what a fear of movement is. I come from the neighborhoods and I 
for many years of my life have been one of the people to be furtive and stealthy in my ways. And I don't even know what it's called. I know when I see it, when I go down the street, I know exactly what it means to act in a stealthy way. I know who's up to no good. I know who's up to something, but I don't know how to articulate that. Thank goodness I'm not in law enforcement. What I do know is that these movements may or may not be accurate. I just know what it is when I see it. But that's not enough for the Constitution, thankfully. So citing fear of movements are the reasons, by the way, that police officers themselves cite for why they used force. That is, used force in 24% of the time on Latinos, 23% of the time on blacks, and 17% of the time on whites. Furtive movements, the box they checked on the forms they have, was because of a furtive movement, reaching or looking or acting in a certain way, which justifies force for the NYPD and other police forces. Possibly, I still haven't thought about this enough, so I don't know how to put this, but some of those furtive movements might largely be based on cultural misunderstandings or even language barriers among members of the Latino community who many of the police force, are they are not from those communities, so everything looks like a furtive movement when you're ignorant to a community's ways of being. So the actual ruling by Judge Shenlin was that police officers have been for years, and this is a quote, been systematically stopping innocent people in the street without any objective reason to suspect them of wrongdoing. And it was declared to be unconstitutional by her at this point because it was a violation of the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments. And the last thing that's very important to think about in terms of stop and frisk, aside from it being a practice, aside from the fact that it's based on a hunch, aside from the fact that it's affecting millions of people's lives based on feelings and perceptions of furtive movements, in other words, people's dignity being arrested, I pun intended, based on the cop feeling that something just kind of doesn't seem right, I don't know. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that Acting out and speaking out is actually very important. So not only what happened here two days ago, but what's happening all over the country, that is resistance to, pol to practices like stop and frisk are important because to determine stop and frisk constitutionality, there's a level of what uh, uh, case law calls community resentment, which under Terry, again held up by the Supreme Court, is a relevant indicator of the quality of the intrusion by police. That is, community resentment and how you judge resentment actually matters in how you can determine whether or not mm. practices and policies should be implemented on the bodies of human beings. So speaking up, speaking out, whether you're in the police force or a citizen or any aspect of life, speaking out matters so much that when the Supreme Court determines whether or not these practices by law enforcement are constitutional, they look to all of you. They looked to all the people th that were in the room two days ago, in, on or off campus, in any community, and what you say and how you feel actually does matter. Because for a long time, how police felt and what they think they saw mattered for so long. We'll realize what you feel also matters very much. So look for the police officers' furtive movements and decide to speak out, and that makes its way into case law. Thank you.